Okay. Oh, there it is. All right. Looks like they can hear. So in introduce yourself. All right. I'm Peter Martins. I farm with my father, Klaus, uh, in Penny Ann, New York. We have about 1,500 acres. Um, I guess apparently some people think that we know what we're doing. Uh, I guess I'll go through kind of what our strategy is, different areas. The strategy for weed control will be different, but these are some ground rules that hopefully some people can work from. Uh, it all starts with seedbed preparation and with, uh, with rotation planning. Now, obviously, you don't want to grow row crops after row crops after row crops because the same weeds that would affect soybeans will affect corn and, and vice versa. So you could just create a massive population of weeds. Typically, we would grow uh, corn plowed or uh, clover plowed down for corn, corn followed by soybeans, soybeans followed by a uh, winter small grain, and then that winter small grain seeded to clover and back into corn. That way, we break up the weed cycle and get away from the, the weeds that would be a major problem. Uh, also important is seed bed preparation. You want to get the crops out of the ground as quickly as possible and also use that tillage to, to limit the weed pressure. Uh, typically we would use four, four corn, a moldboard plow followed by a couple of secondary tillage passes to break up the ground and make a, a good seed bed. Uh, in the fall we would just use a disc, typically. Uh, with a corn planter, uh, again, this is just to, to make sure that the crop has every advantage it possibly can, uh, making sure that the planting depth is appropriate, that the seed is well singulated, that the fertilizer is uh, generally two inches to the side and two inches below the, the seed to avoid burning the crop, but also to have it readily available once the crop starts growing. And also making sure that uh, all of the wear parts are within the the right working parameters. If you're, if anything is completely worn out, it obviously is not going to do the same job as when they're new. Uh, the same basically goes with the grain drill. The seed soil contact is very important and so are the wear parts. Uh, following planting with row crops, typically we would go in with a tine weeding when the crop is just about ready to emerge but not out of the ground yet. And then a second time, uh, sometimes five days, sometimes two weeks later, depending on the growing season. Uh, of course, if, if you start to see weeds growing, uh, you need to get them with a tine weeder while they're still uh, white threads to possibly up to a small two leaf stage. Beyond that, a tine weeder will have a hard time doing much to the weed. Uh, this is just an idea of what. Uh, what we look for when we've uh, completed a tine weeding pass. Uh, the ground is fairly well disturbed, but not too deeply, and that would bring any weeds up to the surface and expose them to, uh, to the sun and to wind. And again, just after tine weeding. Uh, depending on weather conditions, uh, we use different tine weeding strategies. In real wet conditions, uh, we typically would try to bury the weed because if you bury a weed when it's real wet and then get a good rain afterwards, it'll seal that weed in, limit the oxygen available, and the weed will die. If we're real dry and we bury a weed, it'll come right back out. Then we want to pop it up on top and expose the roots and be sure that it dries out completely. Uh, just another tine weeder. This is an older one. It still works. A uh, chain-mounted kovar with 45 degree tines. Now, this is at Crayers, another chain-mounted machine. Uh, this, I believe, is in Oats. And there are several types of tines uh, on the Kovar. There's the straight tine, which is a real good unit for burying. 85-degree uh, tine would typically be used for a tap-rooted crop, something like a, a soybean or a dry bean because the, the weeds that are generally a problem there have a branching root system, which this will hook out of the ground, but the, the tap-rooted crop will stay put. The tine will follow on each side of the root, but leave the crop alone. And this is the 45 degree. This is the most general tool. Depending on adjustment, this can be used either to bury or to pop weeds out of the ground. 
And this is what we typically would use on corn. Uh, there are other types of tine weeders out there. This is an Einbach unit that has been adapted to the, the frame that we have for our covars. Uh, this is a machine that uh, I designed and we had built, and it's a 45 foot uh, covar. So the, these machines can cover quite a few acres in a day. This one, I've done 15 acres per hour before with. So it is feasible for large scale farms. And it folds up within, uh, within the size that you're allowed to go down the road with. And here are some of the other tine weeders. Uh, this machine here is a Lely. That has an 85 degree tine, but at the base of the clip here, the, the tine is actually held. It's a little bit hard to describe uh, over the webinar because we're, we're not really in person, but um, the tine isn't able to move to the left and right of, its, uh, of where it's mounted. That makes it ideal for soybeans because um, you can adjust above the row slightly easier and between the rows more aggressively to take out weeds without doing so much damage to the crop. Uh, the large machine down here, I believe this is in Austria, this is a Hatzenbichler. Uh, they're designed mostly for small grains, though. They're kind of a more aggressive machine. Another picture of the Hatzenbichler. After we've finished the uh, tine weeding, in small grains, that would be it. Uh, after that, the small grains should be about home free uh, shortly after they would start shooting and uh, weed pressure would drop off. But with row crops, then we go to row cultivation. And again, these are guidelines. This is what we shoot for. It doesn't always happen. Uh, Usually we try to have the crop just as large as possible before the weeds get to uh, be about an inch tall, maybe with uh, late second or late two leaf to early three leaf stage on, on broadleaf weeds. And at that point, usually with a well-adjusted row cultivator, um, you can get good control. And then we would come in a second time if the weeds reach two inches tall or before the crop's too tall. We've had times where the crop actually just takes off and we've never gone in a second time. And there are times when we have to go in a third time when we have a real dry season and the crops just don't grow as fast as the weeds are. And you see here, we adjust the, uh, the shanks on the cultivator as close to the row as we can without really disturbing the root zone of the crop. And that way we can put pressure on the soil around the crops, pop out any real small weeds that are just barely held to the soil, and get them to desiccate. And also, if we have enough speed, that allows us to throw dirt into the, into the row and bury weeds that are in that zone. Uh, this is another unit that we use. This is an international front mount. And here's another picture. With, that is set up only to work on each side of the row and to be quite aggressive on each side of the row and then leaving the, the work between the rows to a rear mount unit. This rear mount unit has a side shifter so that as we're working across a hill we can move the cultivator to the left or right of the center of the tractor to compensate for any drift of the tractor on this, that side hill. Now this is a large European machine uh, this is a 12 row Einbach that has uh, what we call a, a European tine. I'm not sure what the official name would be, but it, it looks similar to an oh, this picture will work. Looks similar to an S tine, and then it has the wedge here with a shank coming down. And this shovel may look like a typical cultivator shovel, but it's not. It's a very small, or a very thin steel. It runs quite flat to the, uh, to the surface of the ground, and perhaps uh, one inch under the surface. Uh, this provides more of a cutting action than a plowing action, 
and with larger weeds it, it kind of cuts the root system off like a more like a knife and less of uh, lifting the weed out of the ground. When when I've hit corn with this before, I didn't even realize that the corn had died until I came back on the next pass and it was beginning to wilt. The crop was still standing. This allows much uh, higher speed operation while still doing a reasonably good job of weed control. Uh, for that uh, European time, there also are these, I believe they're called beet hoes. Um, they're for working close, in real close to small crops. The row would be in between. And they can be adjusted real closely and have very little soil disturbance right up against a young crop. Here's a Hudson Bickler row cultivator with what they call a, uh, a star disc in the back. These uh, rubber fingers are actually driven underneath the, uh, the axle here by a set of steel fingers. So they move faster than the speed of travel, reaching directly into the row and plucking out small weeds, theoretically leaving the crop. It, it's a theory. We haven't <laughs> We haven't had enough experience to see how well this works yet. And they're, they have different color discs for different uses. Um, I'm not real well versed on what color you use for what, but in general, the, uh, the yellow ones would be used for a fairly hardy crop, something like corn and beans or something else that has uh, less of a uh, branching root system, you would use these orange ones. They're a little bit softer rubber. And then they have a white one as well that instead of being squarish fingers here, are completely rounded fingers. And those would be used for a, a very small crop. Um, I've seen pictures of them being used in onions before. And they're not supposed to do as much damage to a, a crop that's growing beneath, beneath the soil. Also available, and again, I don't have a lot of experience with these, would be these sets of tines that actually cross within the row and would pluck out uh, small weeds that the, the cultivator shovels weren't able to get. And then there's this tool as well, which would be, I think, and it shut itself off on me here. Uh, this tool is normally used on potato hills once the hills have been established to wipe out small weeds without doing aggressive cultivation later in the season. I've heard that some people have actually used them for training strawberries as well, but I don't know much about that. I guess we'll look for any questions now. Is that you? Yeah.